Hey everyone, I'm Keith Crane. And I'm Abby Hooten, and we're on staff here at the Vineyard. We're so glad that you're here today. If you've not yet filled out a Connect card, you should. It's one of the best ways to get connected at the church. If you're on site, the card is in the seat back right in front of you, and you can drop that off with the Welcome Center in the atrium. Or you can simply scan the QR code to fill it out electronically. Here at the Vineyard, we value loving Jesus, growing together, and giving back. And one of the ways we put those values into practice is through events. So we would like to give you a sneak peek of what that looks like in January. January 3rd, Young Adult Gathering kickoff. And we, well, not you, Keith, you're over 30, sorry, will continue to meet each Tuesday after that. Middle school and high school students gather for the WAVE on Wednesdays in January. Everyone is invited to a 90-minute workshop on how to get more from your Bible time. And our Better Man event is for, well, you guessed it, not you. It's for men. And in the months to come, there's a preschool drive-in, a night of worship, refresher, bag hunger food drive, and baptisms, just to name a few. Now, we don't expect you to remember all that, but take a look at your program. And you remember that QR code? You can scan it to find upcoming events, or you can download the Vineyard app to learn more about the church. If you've been around here for the month of December, you know we are trying to raise money to help open a Christian school in New Delhi, India. This would include purchasing 800 desks, 40 computers, two school buses, and office furniture. Later in the service, Pastor Mark will give some more information as well as an update on our progress to meet that goal. But if you already know that you want to give, simply visit thevineyard.org slash give and select India School Donations in the drop-down menu or give in person by writing India on a giving envelope and dropping off your donation in one of the giving boxes throughout the building. We're about to start the Christmas Eve service. So before we go, for those on site, if you kept your cell phone on, we ask that you turn that on silent now. And if you've chosen to keep a child with you and they get a little too restless, we ask that you take them out to the atrium where you can still watch and listen to the message out by the fireplace. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas Vineyard! Vineyard! Are you guys here to worship Jesus too? <laughs> well, <laughs> you might have to wait in line. Joseph is pretty enamored with him right now. The shepherds are too. They think Jesus looks like me. <laughs> I think it's too early to tell. Anyways, I should probably introduce myself. I'm Mary of Nazareth, and whew, it's been a long journey. And we're not just traveling because of the census either. Even before we arrived in Bethlehem, my family had come a long way. Let me tell you the story while we wait. It all started at home in Nazareth when the angel Gabriel appeared to me. Has this happened to any of you guys? <laughs> Probably not, right? I tell you, it scared me. But Gabriel comforted me and said I had found favor with God. Then he told me this huge, this terrifying, this encouraging news. I was to be the mother of the Messiah, and soon. <laughs> At first, I didn't understand. I had never slept with a man, and I was yet to be married to Joseph. But Gabriel said that the Holy Spirit would come upon me, and I was to give birth to a child, and to call that child the Son of God. Then he said something that helped. Nothing is impossible with God. So, I summoned up my courage and said, let this happen as you said. What happened challenged my faith, but the news of the unplanned pregnancy really shook Joseph. In fact, he was going to call off our engagement. We spent a lot of time in prayer after that. But 
since nothing is impossible with God, the Lord took care of that too. He sent an angel to Joseph in a dream and said he was not to leave me, but to marry me and be the father of the child. After that, I departed for three months to visit my cousin Elizabeth, who was also having a supernatural pregnancy herself. In her old age, God had opened her womb and said she'd give birth to a prophet who would tell everyone about Jesus. At the time, I even became a songwriter. I mean, God was sending the Savior. How could I not rejoice? Do you mind if I share just a little bit of a song I wrote with you? Okay. <clears throat> My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, not long after that, the news of the census hit, and we had to travel to Bethlehem to register. I wondered how I'd handle the trip with my due date so near, but I remembered. Nothing is impossible with God. So, off we went. And that brings us to tonight. Labor started earlier today, and I gave birth in a stable, which is not ideal, believe me, but all the ends were full due to the census. So we wrapped Jesus up and placed him in the only bed we had, a feeding trough. The miracle of birth. How wonderful. How hard. <laughs> But after all we've been through, we knew. Nothing is impossible with God. I know I've been saying over and over again how nothing is impossible with God. But he wasted no time telling everyone the news of Jesus' birth. At first he sent one angel, and then an army of angels to tell the shepherds. And they came hurrying from their fields, and they're still here, keeping the baby occupied and praising God. Maybe now I can pry Jesus away from those doting men. After all, Jesus is for everyone. Merry Christmas, everybody. I'm Steve Huffman. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at the Vineyard. It's good to see everybody. Thanks for choosing to join us either here at Jackson Road or online. Welcome to those online. Uh, many of you have heard that same story retold. Some of you may have heard it like dozens and dozens of times. And uh, what I find interesting about the account of Mary and Jesus' birth is the response right after the shepherds come and visit him. It was up on the screen, but let me read it to you. It says, the shepherds returned after seeing Jesus, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. So for the last 2,000 years or so, people have been celebrating the story of Jesus, whether you've heard it just a few times or dozens of times. And after they hear it, they just praise and sing songs to God, thanking him for Jesus. And so we're going to do that same thing tonight. I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to pray, and we're going to worship. Just like they did right after they found Jesus, just like many churches are doing around the world, we get to join with them. So let's pray. So Father, whether we've heard that account once or dozens of times, I pray that tonight, we worship you like we've heard it the first time. So help us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
so much for worshiping with us. There will be more worship to come later in this service, but for now, you guys can go ahead and greet each other and say Merry Christmas before you take a seat. Hey, you guys, my name is Mark Pope. I'm the lead pastor of the church. Merry Christmas to you guys. Yep, Merry Christmas, you guys. So glad you're here. Glad we're taking some time, setting aside in the midst of the busyness to honor God. Uh, one announcement from me. Just want to celebrate your generosity. A lot of you know, if this is your church, you probably know this, that we've uh, been uh, collecting an offering to help start a school in India. And our original goal was... Uh, actually, we set aside $70,000 from our budgeted money because you guys have been so ge generous. We were asking for $30,000 more to help with buying office furniture, uh, computers, things like that, uh, some school buses because they're just going to kick off this school. And instead of $30,000, you guys gave this. Ta-da! So, that's right. So under your seats, you can all find about uh, $474 in an envelope. There's four people going, are you serious? <laughs> no. No, we shared uh, their, their goal there is to have eight buses. So likely we'll be able to right away, instead of offering them two buses, we'll give them three buses. And you can still give to that if you'd like. It is a phenomenal cause. But thanks for your generosity. Um, for the talk, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2, and I know you don't go to Christmas Eve services to hear a, a long sermon, and so I won't give you a long sermon, but I do want to give you a couple ideas that I think can make this Christmas more meaningful, not necessarily to us, yes to us, but to God. So I'll begin with this idea. Up on the screen is a picture of my son-in-law, Andrew Kurtz, and he's one of the pastors on staff. This was a picture that we took uh, at a birthday celebration at our house we try to set aside time when somebody has a birthday, and we get together, and we have a meal and some cake, and, and that, and it probably doesn't look so different than if you've been to a birthday celebration. We eat and do the cake thing, and then we go into our living room, typically, where the birthday person will sit, sometimes in the special birthday chair, and, and we gather around. And so if you, can you picture that? Like, you know, because it's present time. Well, I want to introduce to you an, an idea that would be really, really strange. So if we did that celebration, and then let's say Andrew sat there in the, in the birthday, you know, uh, chair, wouldn't it be weird if instead of giving Andrew a gift, we all just exchanged gifts to each other, and Andrew just sat there and he got nothing on his birthday? Now, would that just be weird? Like, yeah, that would never happen. Why? Why? Because we know that part of birthday celebrations include giving gifts to the person whose birthday we're celebrating. Make sense? Is that right? I know it's Christmas Eve, but right? I mean, right? Okay. So that idea provokes this thought. It'll come up on the screen. What gifts could we offer Christ this Christmas? That's what we're going to talk about. We've been in a series called Mary's Christmas, and we've been noticing the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus, her part in the Christmas account, and just to remind us of so much that Mary was a part of, um, angels come to Mary, then she, uh, they share with her that she's going to be the miraculous mother of God, she's going to endure the pregnancy. Uh, and then there's the classic traveling to Bethlehem, and the uh, birth comes. Um, and we'll get in Luke 2, verse 4, where it talks about the night of Jesus' birth. It says in verse 4, Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David. You know this story. 
because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, is it time for the baby? The time for the, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. There's a little more of the story where God announces the birth to some shepherds, and they come, and they worship. There's another account in uh, Matthew, I think it is, that includes some wise men, we call them, or magi from the east come. They actually bring gifts to Jesus. But this account in Luke 2 finishes like this, talking about the shepherds. It says, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And in verse 19, it says, But Mary, she's really kind of our topic, but Mary treasured all, treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. What I see in this story about Mary is two potential gifts that she gives to Jesus during this uh, a story of the nativity. And the application for us is I think that these kinds of things that she does, we could do today. So I, I would hope that we, I you know a lot of you are coming, you're trying to honor God. And even you coming here this evening, it's a gift to God. You're trying to honor him. Uh, there's a couple things I see here that we might do that would really please him. So let me pray and I'll give you a couple ideas. A bunch of us, Lord, are pretty intentional about trying to honor you. Not just on Christmas, but we're here tonight or we're watching online because we, you're just that important to us. And so will you again today help us learn from some things that Mary did so well. In Jesus' name, amen. I got two ideas. By the way, your Christmas present is I'm not going to make you write anything down. You can if you want. That was legit applause, like, <laughs> thanks, man, I hate it when I have to write stuff down. So you can write stuff down if you'd like. Well, actually, you need to. Um, no, but here's, some, here's two ideas I got from the Christmas story. Mary offered Jesus some practical comfort, practical comfort, and you'll probably remember these, but it's the idea that when she wrapped him in cloths and put him in a manger, folks, can I tell you, that was probably pretty wonderful for that little baby. Just a reminder of where that baby came from. Christ came from heaven, right? He left heaven to come to the earth. What do you think the weather is like in heaven? Perfect. You nailed it. You think it's ever like it is right now outside in heaven? Amen. Can we agree upon that? No. There's no wind chill in heaven. So he, left, he leaves heaven, and then he's implanted in the womb of Mary, and he spends nine, month, nine months in her womb, which would have been a, a fairly perfect temperature, right? 98.6. It's like a little human womb hot tub in there. Everything's good. And then comes the birth. And this is going to be the first physical experience that Jesus would ever have with not the perfect atmosphere. Because the birth's going to happen and it's going to be what? Like maybe 70 and a little breezy. And if you're used to perfection, although we might go for 70 right now, there's going to be a little bit of, oh, this is not quite as comfortable as the whole womb thing. By the way, this is what we do, I think, a lot today when a baby's born, right? They, first of all, they check the health of the baby to make sure everything's good. And one of the things they did with our kids was right away, they would wrap them and they would put them under like the little, uh, the, 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 the kid microwave thing where they put them in there. It's, it's not a microwave, but a heat, it's a something, radiant heater. It's the kid oven where you, right? So the kid feels, oh. Now, just to be clear, now, I don't know Jesus' mental capacity when he was in the infant stage, but my guess is when Mary wraps him in cloths and puts him in a manger, which would add some insulation if it was, had hay in it, right? Jesus, and if not Jesus, the God of the universe is looking down and saying, by the way, thank you, that's a gift to my son because it was feeling a little imperfect. So, Here's, uh, where am I? 
Here it is. So, uh, here's a question then. It'll come up on the screen. Is there a way we could offer Jesus something like that? Like something practically comfortable? And can I tell you, there actually is. And, and uh, we'll spend the rest of the time with this point talking about we can do that when we try to meet the needs of uncomfortable human beings around us in the name of Christ. When there are people going through difficulty and we then offer them some help. Some of you think, well, what's the difference? How does that work if we're helping people and we're helping Jesus? Here's an important text in Matthew 25. There's a parable there. It's connected with those who follow God and do what's right. And Jesus ends up sharing with them this idea of, he says, I was hungry. By the way, that's uncomfortable to be hungry. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and that's uncomfortable and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. By the way, when he's telling this story, the people around are going, when did we do that for you? I didn't. We didn't ever do that for you. And that's when Jesus then teaches. It says, the king will reply, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did for me. Really practical. When we see another person in need with, I think this matters, with Christ in mind, and we help them, give comfort to them, God, it is a gift to God somehow supernaturally. He's like, thank you for doing that. Jesus said, you did it for me. And so my little challenge, if you want to give Christ a gift this Christmas, is here, you can put it on the screen, help a struggling human, struggling human with Jesus in mind. Over the next 24 hours, could we be attentive? And when we see a person in need, Maybe you're at a family get-together and you know that they're uncomfortable. They're not feeling great inside or they're feeling alone. Or out. Could you do something kind for them? Um, or maybe you'll be out and about this evening. Some of you probably still have Christmas shopping to do. There's four of you probably like, how did he know that? Yeah, because that, no, or something. You'll be out. You might see somebody on the way home that is in need, stop, check on them, see how they're doing in the name of Christ, and that could be a gift to God. It'd be great if we did those kinds of things and Jesus in heaven felt like he was getting a Christmas gift. So Mary offered Jesus some practical comfort, and the other thing is she offered Jesus some emotional space and uh, what I mean by that is she kept an unusual amount of clarity in her mind to focus on him, even though I'll bet her life was fairly hectic in the midst of giving birth to the Messiah. It says in verse 19, 19 she treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The word ponder there is it looks like this in the original language. It's a verb and it means to keep close. It means to preserve. It means to keep in mind. And I would wonder if in the midst of all the activity that Mary went through, whether it wouldn't be easy to lose track of keeping Jesus at the forefront of her mind, just to remember some of the things that she went through. She'd had a pretty busy season. She had the angelic visit. She had the surprise pregnancy. She had the mandatory trip to Bethlehem for the census, and she was nine months pregnant. Then labor happens. They have to scramble for a place to give birth. They end up giving birth in a stranger's barn type place. And this was a new idea for me. In the midst of it all, after she's given birth to Jesus, my guess is she was tired. And then some shepherds come along and they say, can we visit now? And it would just be surprising if she was like, no, I need a nap. Go away. And why did you bring the sheep anyway? Right? It would be easy. No? Like it would be easy 
to, to be, I need, just go. No, if you were, if you were Joseph and you say, hi, honey, what you thinking about? It wouldn't be surprising. She'd be like, nothing. I don't want to think about anything. But instead of nothing, she was pondering. She was strategic and, and took notice, and she wasn't letting the things that were happening that were so about God just get overshadowed by all of the stuff. And if you want to give God a gift this Christmas, don't let the hustle and the hectic that's happening this evening for some of us or tomorrow with the family or all those things and the presence and the stuff, carve out regular moments where you ponder the reason for the season, which is Christ. That'll be a gift to God. I had a picture come to my mind when I was working on this little talk, and I wouldn't it be neat if in, in the next 24 hours, just a group this size, you know, there's a couple hundred people in here, if God over the next 24 hours had random moments, like dozens and dozens and dozens of random moments over the next 24 hours, where we set aside a moment to ponder Jesus. It's not a bad picture of what worship is, by the way. That's what worship is. It's making space in our minds to focus on God in a world that is focused so easily on a whole bunch of other stuff. So those are a couple of ideas for us to bring the Father, Christ, a gift this Christmas. I hope that we'll do it. Right now we have a an opportunity, if the worship team wants to come, an opportunity to do what we just talked about in the second idea, and that is to ponder and to give our mental, emotional attention to Christ. We're going to finish our time with some uh, worship, some music and songs that focus our attention on Him. So would you stand? And uh, I'll pray. And hopefully we will please the Lord Jesus for a few minutes here. We, a bunch of us do, we take this time to try to hold on tightly to the reason for Christmas. We try to honor you with our mind and in our hearts and with our emotions. And through these songs, Lord, they're going to bring up theological truths about who you are and why we should worship you. And so not unlike the angels or Mary or Joseph, it'd be great if we offered you some worship for the next few minutes. That's our hope in Jesus' name. Amen.
would be seated for a minute or so, and then we'll do standing for a closing prayer. Just want to give you an idea. I know in a group like this, maybe even online, there are typically uh, some of us who, when we talk about all hail King Jesus, we regularly are honoring Jesus. There's also Christmas season tends to bring out folks just for the Christmas thing, right? I'm not going to make you stand, but you're probably here. You got invited from a friend, and, and here's what I would just invite you to consider. Throughout history, there have been groups of people, like the shepherds, they were distinct among their generation where they pursued Jesus. They took extra effort to try to honor the birth of Jesus. And I would invite you to consider, be, that, be those people. If you don't have a church home, find a church home. Come, to, come, come here, but be a person who doesn't just do some spiritual Christmassy thing, you know, once a year. That's not what God sent his son for. He didn't send his son so that we would have a Christmas thing. He sent his son as an invitation to us all to be worshipers of God in relationship with God. And so if that's something that you've never explored, you really should. Uh, and if you don't have a church to do that, and come and hang out with us. Uh, we're perfect. And we... <laughs> seeing if you were paying attention. We're not. Well, we're pretty intent on trying to honor God and, and attend to our relationship with God and honor Jesus. So that said, why don't you stand and uh, we'll close.